Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 17 in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, May the 24th. First, I'll be talking to Brad Adam, who started developing Rare Foods Australia's globally unique artificial reefs for abalone while witnessing the decline of wild stocks and the introduction of tighter quotas in the Augusta region of Western Australia. The result is Rare Foods Australia's world first habitats or abalone habitats. And I'll talk to economist Saul Lislake about the challenges for Jim Chalmers' third budget. But first, let's talk to Brad Adams. Well, Brad, you set yourself up as an abalone rancher with Rare Foods and you set it up with uh, globally unique artificial reefs. Tell us how did that happen? So many years ago, I was a commercial abalone diver, um, diving the coastline of Western Australia, harvesting abalone from the wild. I have a background with my family. My father started the industry here back in the 1960s. Um, so it's been in a sort of a family business, harvesting abalone from the wild. It was around the mid-2000s when uh, I started noticing the, the stocks declining and thought there's got to be a better way of producing abalone from the wild. And that's when we started playing around with putting artificial reefs on the seabed. We had access to juvenile abalone from a hatchery and started doing small trials on just placing those hatchery reared juveniles, um, putting them on the reef and seeing what happened. And from those trials, the business started evolving and we thought, geez, we're onto something here. And around about 2011, we did a quite a large trial to understand different things around what sort of design of reef you should use, how many abalone should go on those reefs, what's a good location, what size they should go out at. And from those trials, it gave us confidence to um, attract investment to scale the business up. So in 2014, we actually uh, started the business with the current habitat design. We, we created what we call the habitat, which is a play on words between abalone and habitat. So it's just a, a habitat for abalones. And the business has continued to grow since 2014 to the, to the size now where we've got 10,000 habitats on the seabed. Uh, in Flinders Bay here and it's quite a large to give you an idea of the scale of the, of the business 10,000 of those habitats side by side equals 20 kilometers of reef um, and on that reef there's more than 2 million abalone living on it we harvest you know, up to 90 tons a year of wild harvest abalone for the export markets around the world now so yeah from humble beginnings we've um, now got a, a reasonably sizable business and it's exciting and we've created a created a, a pretty diverse ecosystem there with the artificial reef that we've built uh, in Flinders Bay. Well artificial reefs are fairly unique globally I mean you'd, you'd be the only company in the world doing this. We are the only company doing uh, abalone ranching of, of this scale using artificial reefs yeah so it's pretty unique it's it's very sustainable because once you've built the reef all we're doing is putting abalone from a hatchery back on there so we don't have to worry about recruitment naturally. With a, we, we know that we've always got abalone coming through. And, yes, it's, it's so sustainable that we've actually recently achieved uh, Marine Stewardship Council certification as a, a wild fishery. So from, from what was uh, sand and seagrass to putting the artificial reef down there, we've now created a, Australia's newest fishery and we're harvesting you know, up to 90 tonnes a year of wild premium green lip for markets around the world. That's, that's quite extraordinary. Now, what, what sort of challenges did you deal setting up with a business like that? I mean, this is quite extraordinary. Oh, there's probably a dozen, a dozen moments there where we thought it was never going to happen, like any businesses. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, issues. Well, originally it was raising capital to convince people that I wasn't stupid and, and out there crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, that was... That was um, one of some of the early challenges. Actually learning, um, it, it, it takes three to four years before you can harvest an abalone off the reef. So, you know, it's, it, it's not something you can get instant results out of. So it takes time to understand what's happening. And we're still learning every day um, what's happening on the reef out there um, and, and increasing that knowledge every year. To get government, reg, uh, government authorities uh, in the early eight days to approve what we're doing was difficult um, because, you know, no one had ever done it. And I had to convince them that, you know, we, we weren't going to have a negative impact on the environment, number one, and that number two, this could be a, a profitable and sustainable business. And then 
Yeah, so so it took a, a fair bit of time to get through the licensing, but um, now that the the government is actually a big supporter of what we do because we've created something that's unique, um, something that other states don't have, and um, yeah, we're producing more abalone now out of out of the wild than the rest of um, Western Australia's wild catch um, industry combined. That's quite extraordinary. Now, who are your investors? Well, originally it just started out with friends and family um, that I, that I convinced that I wasn't completely nuts. But it grew from there. Uh, we listed on the stock exchange in 2017, and with about four years' history behind us, and we were able to um, tap the equity markets, um, particularly out of the east coast, to to invest um, in the business to expand. So that initial expansion in 2017 allowed us to um, double the size of the reef from what it, from what it was, and also um, invest in um, a state of the art processing facility on the marina in Augusta. So yeah, that's uh, that capital um, allowed us to get to where we are today. And uh, you also, I believe, Rare Foods is also branching out into ocean salad wines. Is that right? Yeah. So the the company uh, originally started its life as ocean grown abalone. But then we found once we were in the market selling our abalone that they were also chasing other premium products um, out of Western Australia as well and that we could potentially offer. And so we're looking at one of the, the lowest hanging fruit was obviously um, selling um, some of the wild catch um, abalone that, that comes in around the area. But then we saw an opportunity. Uh, we're actually selling uh, wine on the seabed. It had been done uh, over in France and a, a couple other locations around the world by some uh, pretty high-end wine wine companies. So yeah, we started doing that, and it's it's getting um, gathering a lot of steam. We've got about five thousand bottles in the water this year to to sell at the end of the year, and um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a way of um, maturing the wine um, quicker and provides a unique point of difference uh, when you retrieve the wine because it's got the biofouling growth on the bottle and uh, it, it, it is, a, is a great marketing advantage as well. So we've been able to get some good media around that and also get some good sales. How do you sell a wine in, an, in the ocean? Yeah, so you get the, uh, the sparkling wine when it's on lees and, and let it mature for 12 months in a controlled environment, which is the ocean. So, you know, the light's filtered out at 18 metres. Um, there's swell always moving the wine. So what we've found is that by placing them in sealed containers on the seabed, that after 12 months, the wine has a, a, a much more complex flavours um, than, than its land-matured cousin, but it also has the, the biofouling on the external of the bottle, which everyone is completely different, so each bottle has its own unique signature. So we retrieve them, um, dry out the fouling and um, put them in a nice box. And yeah, the demand for these for these uh, wines is just through the roof. So yeah, it's a real opportunity there for us to diversify. And we're also looking for other rare and premium products out of the Southwest region here, which is well known for its um, fine wines, its uh, premium foods and premium seafood, particularly with, the, uh, with what we do. So we're looking for other products to add into Um, what we um, offer um, global markets, which is why we changed our name to Rare Foods. And the actual abalone itself, what's the flavour like compared to normal abalone? It's exactly the same as normal abalone. So normal abalone from the wild tastes exactly the same as our wild abalone. They're eating the same foods. Um, they're living in the same environment. They're exactly exactly the same. So that's why we're able to um, get the MSC certification and be certified as a wild enhanced fishery. But, uh, but all of this uh, wild enhancement actually goes to your brand, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, it, it's just um, wonderful to be able to go out into the market uh, and, and be able to espouse the benefits of your product um, because not only is it a, a product that's cultured in, the, in a marine park, in a, in a wild environment here in the southwest, but it's actually been certified by the world's gold standard in certifying fisheries, which is the Marine Stewardship Council, as a comp- completely sustainable products. So to be able to go to the market and say, look, here we've got a product which is just amazing. You've got to have it on your menu, but it's also sustainable. It gives you, you know, it gives those um, customers that confidence that what they're purchasing today is going to be there tomorrow as well and, and is produced using completely sustainable practices. And and you've also exporting it, aren't you? Well, it all pretty much all gets exported. Yeah, so Southeast Asia is, is a strong market for us. The traditional markets in Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam uh, uh, have always been traditionally strong markets for abalone because uh, abalone is highly revered as a, a seafood product in those countries. It's, it's you know, number one, two and three 
um, when it goes out on the banquet tables. It's, it's a must-have for weddings and, and celebrations in Southeast Asia. But we're also getting a lot of traction now um, in the US and, and the EU um, because of our sustainability credentials, because the, the customers in those markets are quite sophisticated in their education around purchasing sustainable products. And that now that we actually have that um, sustainability certification, third-party certification, uh, we're, we're certainly gaining tractions in those new markets. So we're really looking forward to uh, supplying those markets and, and growing our demand, which um, if we grow our demand, we'll then hopefully we can grow price and, and, and continue to grow profits. Well, Brad, it's been a delightful talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Leon. Fantastic. And now let's talk to economist Saul Eslake. Well, Saul, what did you think of Jim Chalmers' third budget? Well, I thought different things about different bits of it, to be honest with you, Leon. On the first and probably most important bit in the short term, I think Jim Chalmers basically got the balance right between providing cost of living relief that was a political necessity without materially exacerbating underlying inflationary pressures. What I mean by that is that the renewed round of energy bill relief and the 10% increase in Commonwealth rent assistance to pensioners and beneficiaries who are renting in the private market, where rents have been a major source of inflation, uh, will, to use the Treasurer's phrase, procure mechanical reductions in the consumer price index, which will lower measured inflation compared with what it would otherwise be. And although they are one-off measures, they may have a more lasting impact because there are lots of other prices that are indexed to the CPI. The CPI movements set a benchmark for other businesses in judging how much they can raise their prices by. And of course, movements in the CPI carry a great deal of weight in the Fair Work Commission's decisions about changes in the minimum wage. So in that sense, there may be some more lasting beneficial impacts beyond the mechanical reduction in the CPI that these measures will procure. As an aside, I'm a little puzzled that unlike last year, the energy bill relief is going to be afforded to everyone rather than those who are by some measure in genuine need, as was the case last year. Maybe the government felt it was necessary to assuage those higher income earners who were upset that they won't get as big a tax cut as they'd been originally promised by Scott Morrison six years ago. But it's a bit hard, I think, to justify giving $300 to people who don't need it to pay their electricity bills as well as to people who do. The other thing that has to be weighed up here is the impact of the almost five and a half billion that it will cost the government to implement these two measures on the spending capacity of households and hence on aggregate demand and inflation. I mean, there will, in theory, be some upward impact on inflation from all this additional money flowing to people who, for the most part, are likely to spend all of it. But in the context of a $2.7 trillion economy, as Australia's GDP will be in the coming financial year, that represents about 0.18 percentage points of GDP. So it's relatively small. On balance, therefore, I think the government has in the short term done a reasonable job of walking a fine balance with regard to responding to inflation. I don't think there'll be an increase in interest rates this year. I don't think what the government has done makes it any more likely that there will be a cut in interest rates this year. But I would still expect that it's a reasonable bet there'll be at least one reduction in interest rates early next year before the poll is due no later than the end of May. As to other bits of the budget, I'm uh, perhaps less positive. Uh, the other key feature of the budget from the government's perspective was the Prime Minister's Future Made in Australia program. When it comes to supporting the transition to a zero carbon economy, I have no quarrel with the proposition that that won't happen as quickly as the science tells us it needs to happen without some kind of government involvement. You know, the scale of the investment involved and the risks associated with that investment are too big to expect the private sector to take that on all by itself. So uh, provided that there are appropriate rigour around who gets what, 
from agencies like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, I'm okay with that. But I'm far less okay with large amounts of taxpayers' money being used to subsidize the manufacturing of things that we're not particularly good at. You know, again, I can up to a point understand the desirability of reducing our dependence on a single source of what might be critical products uh, from a country that we might at some point in the future find ourselves in conflict with. You know, up to a point, I understand that. But if our friends, the Americans, are willing to spend squillions of dollars of their taxpayers' money subsidizing the manufacture of things like solar panels, why don't we buy them from them rather than wasting, as I think we would be, squillions of our own taxpayers' dollars subsidizing the manufacture of those things here just because some people think that manufacturing is more important than other types of economic activity and that manufacturing jobs are more important than other types of jobs. I mean, the, the reality is that the countries which are subsidizing manufacturing, countries like the United States, Japan, much of Europe, in those countries, manufacturing is a relatively high productivity form of economic activity. Productivity in manufacturing in the US and Japan and most European economies and in Korea is higher than the average of all industries for those economies. But Australia is one of a handful of so-called advanced economies where manufacturing is actually a low productivity activity. You know, labor productivity in manufacturing in Australia is more than 11% below the average for all industries. So Policies such as tax breaks and subsidies or investment of taxpayers' money in equity in order to induce labor and capital to move into manufacturing will actually, all else being equal, result in lower overall labor productivity and lower overall living standards for Australians. So, you know, I think it's questionable, the merits of doing that. One other thing that caught my eye, of course, is that the cost of what I call the worst public policy decision of the 21st century so far, that is the corruption of the GST revenue sharing arrangements in favour of Western Australia, the cost of the federal budget of that has now blown out to almost $53 billion over 11 years. The estimate in last December's mid-year review of the 2023-4 budget was $39.8 billion. The original estimate, when this dirty deal was done in 2018 by the Morrison government, with the support of the then Labor opposition, was $8.9 billion over eight years. And how the Prime Minister and the Treasurer can reconcile gifting $53 billion from the federal budget to the government of the richest state in the country, so that the richest state in the country can run bigger budget surpluses, and ultimately give its citizens better public services and lower state taxes than every other Australian, how they can reconcile that with their professed commitments to equity and fiscal prudence, uh, I really do not know. And I haven't heard them attempt to try. That's interesting. I mean, well, two points. One, a lot of economists are saying that the budget has actually made the Reserve Bank's job a lot harder. That's one point. And secondly, a lot of businesses are complaining that they didn't get anything. And the government was giving funding to select industries, in effect, picking winners. What's your view about all of this? Well, to the first question, I guess I disagree with my fellow economists who say the budget has made the Reserve Bank's task harder. I don't think it's made it easier, but I don't really believe, for the reasons I outlined before, that it has made the Reserve Bank's task harder than it otherwise might have been. As I say, they will have procured some mechanical reductions in the measurements of inflation. That should be enough to prevent the Reserve Bank from raising interest rates, if it had any inclination to do that. I'm not sure that they did, even though they're explicitly not ruling that possibility out. Uh, nor do I think the budget, however, has done anything to increase the chances of the Reserve Bank cutting interest rates this year. I remain of the view, as I have been since they last raised rates in November 2023, that they would leave rates on hold this year and not start cutting them until the first half of 2025. And, and that remains my view. As to what the budget may have done for business. I'm not sure there was a compelling case in current circumstances for the government to be throwing a lot of money at business in general by reducing, for example, company tax or giving broadly based measures. I certainly don't think there was any case for additional measures to support so-called small business, which is already paying five percentage points less by way of company tax than businesses with a turnover of more than $50 million, thanks to a distortion 
to the company tax system that was introduced by the Turnbull government in 2016 and, and 2017. I do share concerns about the government picking winners, to use your phrase, when it comes to speeding the transition to net zero emissions. I think there is a good case for government involvement in that, uh, as long uh, as I say there are appropriate checks and balances to guard against political favoritism in the distribution of grants designed to speed up the transition to net zero. But in other respects, in particular, what I call manufacturing fetishism, the belief that there's something more important about manufacturing than other types of economic activity, or that manufacturing jobs are more important than jobs in agriculture or mining or in uh, any range of services. Uh, well, I, I don't much care for that. The IMF, in its most recent fiscal monitor that was published in the same week that our treasurer was in Washington, D.C., for the annual IMF and World Bank meetings, had some timely warnings about the risks of uh, what's around the world commonly called industrial policy. Uh, they said it's very difficult to get it right and that history shows that there are substantial risks of money being allocated on the basis of political considerations rather than economic ones. And frankly, the excuse that we have to do this because lots of other countries doing it is, I think, you know, borderline childish as well as not being particularly sensible economic policy. I mean, if other countries want to waste their taxpayers' money, uh, that's up to them. It doesn't mean that we ought to do it any more than the fact that uh, the Biden administration is uh, whacking up tariffs on a wide range of imports, particularly but not exclusively from China, uh, doesn't mean that we ought to be doing the same thing. You know, I hope that isn't used as an excuse for raising tariffs in Australia. So far, the government hasn't shown any inclination to do that. But if they think that we have to do what other countries are doing simply because other countries are doing it, well, that's, I think, a potentially very worrying development. And that's interesting what you say about manufacturing in Australia being low productivity. Yeah, I don't think most people realise that. You know, I mean, what I call manufacturing fetishism is fairly widespread. It's bipartisan, and our own history says it's wrong. I, I, I don't say that manufacturing is a low productivity form of economic activity in Australia because workers are lazy, although there is some evidence that management in Australian manufacturing is not as capable as management in manufacturing in some other countries overseas. But the reality is that because manufacturing typically has high fixed costs, in order to be competitive in manufacturing, companies need to be able to achieve scale. That is, they need to produce a lot of widgets so that the fixed cost per unit of widgets is relatively low. And in broad terms, there are only two ways you can achieve scale in manufacturing. One is if you have a large domestic market like China, Japan, the US, Europe, and even Brazil. Have. If you don't have a big domestic market, the other way you can get scale is by exporting to big domestic markets, which countries like Korea, Taiwan, uh, the bit of Canada that's geographically very close to the United States, Ireland, Switzerland, Sweden, Israel, the bit of Mexico that's geographically close to the United States, uh, they all get scale in manufacturing by exporting to big markets. Here in Australia, we don't have a big domestic market, and we are a very long way away from big domestic markets. I mean, even though, you know, people say we're close to Asia, the reality is that Stockholm is closer to Shanghai than Sydney is. Beijing is closer to Berlin than Brisbane is. And we are not geographically proximate to the countries that are big domestic markets, which means that in most cases, we will never achieve the scale required to be internationally competitive in manufacturing. And some of the government's stated intentions seem to fly in the face of that reality or to pretend that it simply doesn't exist or that you can subsidise it away. Well, Saul, that's fascinating stuff. And thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure, Leo. So what's happening in the news? Well, the Reserve Bank Board considered the case for a 14th interest rate hike at its meeting earlier this month, as members discussed that the risks around inflation had risen somewhat and repeated their resolve to do what is necessary to bring price growth back under control. Newly released RBA Board minutes revealed that the process to get inflation back to the midpoint of the 2-3 to three target range was unlikely to be smooth 
and members recognised the considerable uncertainty about the outlook for both inflation and the labour market. Given this, members agreed that it was difficult either to rule in or rule out future changes in the cash rate target, the minute said, echoing comments from the RBA Governor, Michelle Bullock. Board members held the cash rate at 4.35%, but reiterated their resolve to do what is necessary to return inflation to target and to continue paying close attention to developments in the global economy, trends in domestic demand and the outlook for inflation and the labour market. This coincides with the Westpac Melbourne Institute Consumer Confidence Index showing consumer confidence is still in the doldrums, with just over half expecting rate rises to resume over the next 12 months. Added to that, Macquarie Group economists estimate there is a 50% chance of recession this year as a trap of high migration unwinds and high interest rates leave the private sector in stagnation. Macquarie economist Sophie Photios said the economy was like a masquerade, with a surge in immigration had masked the gap between the economy growing modestly in total but going backwards in per-person terms. Strong net migration of more than half a million people over the past year had also added to inflation pressures, including rents, she said. Population is at the centre of, of the Australian story as it is working on growth in a positive way and on inflation in a negative way and has offset the impact of combined policy tightening, Ms Fotios said in a joint report with colleague Graham McDevitt. The huge surge in population has pushed up aggregate growth for the entire economy, yet individually it doesn't feel like strong growth because everyone is getting a smaller piece of that growing pie. Australia's migration pulse is expected to taper off in 2024 when this happened. It does not appear that households business or trade will be able to fill the growth void. We expect gross domestic product GDP to slow into stagnation which we define as between minus 0.5% and 1% with prolonged combined policy tightening increasing the risk of recession to 50-50 in the second half of 2024. Per person GDP declined for the fourth straight quarter in December while the economy eked out a 0.2% growth for the months of 2024. The Macquarie report, previously unreported in the media, was published last month before the federal budget and opposition leader Peter Dutton's plan to cut migration, particularly international students. Macquarie's Ms Fotios and Mr McDevitt said Australia had fallen into a population trap. If an economy's growth is being driven by immigration, as Australia's is today, more and more immigration is needed to hold up aggregate growth in the future. If population growth slows, then aggregate growth slows, and if there is no other driver of growth, the economy is at risk of recession. And Peter Dutton's nuclear energy plans have suffered a setback, with the CSIRO estimating the nation's first large nuclear power plant could cost as much as $17 billion in today's dollars and would not be operational until at least 2040. With the coalition now saying it will announce its nuclear plans by the end of the year, the CSIRO's final annual gen costs report says while large-scale reactor would produce cheaper power than the smaller modular reactors, SMR, as first proposed by the opposition, Position, the electricity would still cost one and a half to twice as much as firm's renewable energy. New large-scale nuclear costs are significantly lower than nuclear SMR, but both represent moderate to higher cost sources to electricity generation, it said. When the CSIRO released findings of, on SMRs as part of its draft report in December, it received a tongue lashing from Mr Dutton. In its final report, the science agency repeats its findings regarding the feasibility of SMRs and also examines large-scale reactors, given the coalition has added them to its energy plans. In an attempt to present a best-case scenario, the CSIRO bases its cost projections on a continuous build program of nuclear power plants in South Korea, which are cheaper than those in the US. Based on this approach, the expected capital cost for large-scale nuclear plant in 2023 is 8,665 kilowatts, it says, meaning a standard 1 megawatt power station would cost $8.65 billion. But the CSIRO cautions that this capital cost can only be achieved if Australia commits to a continuous building program and only after an initial higher-cost unit is constructed. It says a first-of-a-kind FOAK premium applies to all new technologies in energy, including nuclear, and FOAK premiums of up to 100% cannot be ruled out. That means the first large-scale power station could cost just over $17 billion if the full premium applied. The CSIRO also identifies time as, as another hurdle for nuclear power. Given the lack of the development pipeline and the additional legal and safety and security steps required, the first nuclear plant in Australia will be significantly delayed, it says. A 15-plus year total development time would mean that if a decision to pursue nuclear in Australia were made in 2025, with political support for the required legislative changes, then the first full operation would be no sooner than 2040. And Liberal Senator Linda Reynolds and a former staffer Brittany Higgins have failed to 
reached an agreement in a second round of mediation, Ms Reynolds told media outside the West Australian Supreme Court, where she's suing Ms Higgins and her partner David Shiraz for defamation. After three hours of mediation on Tuesday, Senator Reynolds emerged from the court with a lawyer, Martin Bennett, and told reporters, unfortunately it appears at this stage that we will still be heading to trial in July. Earlier on Tuesday, while arriving at court, Senator Reynolds said it was time for the Finance Minister, the Lawyer General and his department to admit they got it wrong. Senator Reynolds paused outside the court on Barracks Street in the centre of Perth, a second attempt at mediation, and urged all parties to accept all of the findings made by Justice Michael Lee in his judgment in April. Justice Lee found that on the balance of probabilities, Ms Higgins was raped by another of Senator Reynolds' employees, Bruce Lehrman, in Senator Reynolds' ministerial suite in 2019, as she had long claimed. I consider it more likely than not in those early hours after a long night of conviviality and drinking, and having successfully brought Miss Higgins back to his secluded place, Mr Lehrman was hell-bent on having sex with a woman he found sexually attractive, Justice Lee said. However, Justice Lee found that there had not been any political cover-up after the rape. This was a central plank of a story Ms Higgins participated in for the project. And Telstra will, will axe up to 2,800 jobs, or about 9% of its workforce, as it races to achieve its ambitious cost savings as part of its much-hyped T25 strategy and partners with Indian tech giant Infosys to automate more engineering tasks. Chief Executive Vicky Brady said the cuts were necessary to ensure Telstra could continue to make the investments needed to support the ever-increasing growth in data volumes on its networks and in deliver improved connectivity for customers across the country. Ms Brady attempted to cauterise the fallout by announcing that Telstra, which employs about 31,000 people, would not be making any price rises linked to inflation to its postpaid mobile plans, with hikes normally happening in July. She also reaffirmed the company's full-year earnings guidance. Ms Brady was adamant the company could deliver most of the remaining $400 million in the next 18 months, most of this will come from the job cuts, which Ms Brady said on Tuesday could achieve $350 million of Telstra's T25 savings. In the past several months, Telstra has been reviewing the cost base of network and services in AS business, which Ms Brady said was clearly a long way from where we needed to be after it delivered flat half-year revenue at $1.35 billion. NAS provides Telstra's enterprise customers with network security and cloud services, among other products. The job cuts are expected to be completed by the end of this calendar year. Ms Brady said staff consultation on 377 of those roles would begin immediately, mainly from areas supporting the products and services in its enterprise division. She said the redundancies would reshape some of Telstra's internal operations by moving its global business services function to other parts of the business. And one of the biggest scam syndicates to ever attack Australia is almost invisible on the, on the corporate regulator's investor alert list. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission has failed to include on the alert list a warning about websites associated with the international scam syndicate that fleeced 34,000 Australians out of more than $200 million. German police sent letters to victims in that country naming websites Infinity Capital G, Top Market Cap, Richmond Super and Iron Bits as being used by the fraudsters in cryptocurrency scans promoted on Facebook and elsewhere online using fake celebrity endorsements. None of the websites came up in a search of ASIC's online Money Smart alert list on Monday, and nor did numerous others associated with the syndicate. Australia was by far the most affected country, making up more than one third of the 90,000 victims from 90 countries. There were 14,000 victims in Canada and 13,000 in Europe. Files shared by German police with ASIC included victims' names, phone numbers, emails, physical addresses, identity documents, notes on their background and total losses. Scammers' names and aliases in each individual case were also provided. German police said it sent the database for the purpose of warning victims they had been dealing with a crime group and were at risk of greater losses. Australians are known to have reported having money stolen from three of the four websites named in the German police letter to victims in that country. Top Market Cap, Infinity Capital G and Richmond Super. The new concerns come as the Albanese government said on Monday it had called for ASIC to explain why it didn't contact and warn victims of the scam, following revelations that German police gave the regulator a comprehensive database of evidence in June last year. The discovery ASIC had not taken the minimal step 
of updating its alerts with the websites associated with the syndicate will likely increase pressure on the agency over its handling of the case and its approach to relentless targeting of Australians by organised crime gangs offshore. And the corporate regulators found that around one third of customers who approach their home loan lender for help because they're struggling with repayments have dropped out of the hardship process due to delays in information requirements. The Australian Securities Investments Commission has lashed banks and non-bank lenders for creating unnecessary barriers hindering customers from obtaining assistance. The problems identified in a report on hardship procedures include poor communication, inadequate staff training, mixed internal messaging and cookie-cutter approaches. ASIC Chairman Joe Longo says the situation is simply not good enough. The regulator is understood to be considering enforcement action against the laggards, while several banks argue their processes are already being improved. ASIC found that 71% of hardship notices were approved with some assistance, such as deferred loan repayments for a period of time. It said 23% of requests were withdrawn or declined when a customer provided insufficient information, while 6% were declined for another reason. In general, Banks treat struggling customers better than non-banks, and bigger banks are better than smaller banks. However, gaps in the support provided were identified at all lenders. The report shows the scale of customers doing it tough across the country. There were 250,000 hardship notices for 144,000 accounts filed in the 18 months to the end of December. This included 53,000 in the last three months of 2023, up 54% on the final quarter of 2022. Banks typically say hardship is created by three factors, unemployment, medical issues or marriage breakdown. ASIC agrees these are credible, but the two biggest are simply overcommitment and reduced income. There were 58,437 notices relating to overcommitting to a debt in the period, raising questions about compliance with responsible lending obligations, while 51,361 relating to reduced income. These were higher than medical issues, 38,982, unemployment, 29,882, and separation, 18,760. The number of customers in hardship is expected to grow as unemployment ticks higher and interest rates stay elevated. Banks have pointed to a small deterioration in bad debts for the March half. ASIC's 157-page report titled Hardship, Hard to Get Help finds concerns including misleading messages that assistance is only available following specific life events such as an illness. Sometimes collection staff don't explore why a customer had missed a payment, or they were too focused on the immediate payment of arrears rather than ensuring the customer could meet their food future obligations. Customers also report having to explain circumstances multiple t- multiple times to different people, onerous requests for documents and overly standardised approaches. The report suggests hardship assistance can be a band-aid solution. It found in about 40% of cases where payments were reduced or deferred, customers fell into arrears right after the assistance period ended. In more than a third of these cases, the customer gave another hardship notice within three months. The regulator has asked lenders to prepare an action plan outlining how they intend to respond to the issues. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Stephen McKeon, founder and CEO of MacGyver Tech and McDerd, about why governments around the world are moving to control TikTok. And I'll be talking to economist Craig James about what's ahead in the market next week. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. If you like Talking Business, please leave us a review with Apple Podcasts. Thank you in advance. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. If you want to contact me, email me at leon at leongetler.com. I answer all emails. Wishing you all a safe and healthy week and looking forward to bringing you Talking Business next week.